Thank you, Simon, for coming back on the Shrewsbury Biscuit and bringing a very special guest with you. Um, I, I can't believe it when you messaged me and you were like, would you like to speak to this guy? And I was kind of like, absolutely. <laughs> when can we do this? Like, um, So bringing uh, with uh, Simon today is, is Reiner Hose. 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 <laughs> We just had a, a, quite a, a glorious interaction there about trying to pronounce the name. Thank you for coming on the show. Um, who's going to do the introduction of who, who Reiner is? Because I feel I'm absolutely unqualified to do this. <laughs> and so, introductions. Simon Bell, episode one. You joined us on The Biscuit. Um, author and um, really great guy. You've been amazing for the show. A really good support. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm privileged to have had you on the show. And today you bring Reiner with you, who is... Um, I'll explain if that helps. Yeah, please um, do. Please do. Probably to put it in context, Reiner and I have known each other for a number of years um, through a joint interest. Mine is an interest Reiner has been thrust upon him. In Auschwitz, the Holocaust, challenging hate, um, challenging the rise of the far right, trying to um, make sure the lessons of the past are learned. Reiner's connection to the Holocaust is more specific than most people in that his grandfather was the commandant of Auschwitz. So his grandfather was a man responsible for over a million people dying within that camp and also for deaths in other camps. Reiner's way of dealing with the heritage of being the grandson of Rudolf Hearst is to campaign against the far right and with me uh, to set up a thing called Footsteps where we look at trying to remember the footsteps of those who walked to death and suffering in the Holocaust and other genocides and try and find ways to, as I said earlier, challenge hate today. So briefly, that's who Reiner is. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, you know. It sounds like an amazing journey you've had. Not, I wouldn't say amazing. It is amazing. It is amazing, regardless of the emotions that I felt in there. What the, the journey that you've had for your life is is is, is extraordinary. And um, but when did you like, as a young age, like when did you first realise what what your family was about? You know, um, your family history. When's the first time you kind of remembered and went, oh, my God, really? I think the first time I realized, it was not the, the clear fact I have today. Yeah. It was only the, the situation I saw the name Hurst the first time in a concentration camp in Dachau. Yeah. And I was a little bit shocked. Well, the, the written was the same like my name. So then I called my dad in the evening and asked him and said, no, 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 it's a spelling mistake. It's Hess. I said, ooh, Jesus, ah. I'm happy. Well, on the blocks in the in the concentration camp, it was written. It was one of the worstest mass murder in twentieth century. Yeah, killing million people. Said Jesus. Yeah, so it's not a mistake that would be made like <laughs> easily, was it? You know, um, I don't know much about German names, but I'm guessing Hess isn't like common. Like you know, Jones and Owens and no. Williams is not not, not no. a common name. So when you see that, you think, ah, that's uh, quite a coincidence. Yeah, and um, how did it affect you when you were younger? Going to school, things out. Like was it like common knowledge who your grandfather was? Going to school, you know. I think in the sc in my school period, it was not not bad. Yeah. So in in schools, it was not taught about the Second World War. So it was a secret in Germany. Oh, okay, so it's like one of those things. Just just don't talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. So when I when I'm coming, I start my training as a cook, and came home and I saw these two books in the bookshelf. So my mom has the the bookshelves around. The stairways, yeah. yeah, around, and I saw these two books: the Commandant of Auschwitz, Rudolf Hess, and I saw the other book: uh, People in Auschwitz from Hermann Langbeiner Survivor. Said, "Oh Jesus!" It was not thinking about the Commandant. It was, oh, they made a mistake again. Yeah. Instead of Hess or Hess, they wrote Hess. And before I could grab these books out of the shelf, my dad comes out like a wizard. <laughs> he got slapped left and right, and he took these books away and said, "You never will read these books." So explain a 15-year-old kid that he never will read these books. So I went down to the kitchen to my mom and asked her, that, what, what happens with these books? Your dad is going to a meeting to Göteborg. Well, he worked in this time as a director for Volvo. So after he passed, he, he went there, you get these books. And that's what she did. And after I read these two books, I packed my, my stuff and went out of the house and never get back. Really? How old were you? 15. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's crazy. 
the book, The Commandant of Auschwitz. Pull up, um, my, pull up my quite into you. The book, The Commandant of Auschwitz, is the, um, <laughs> the memoir of Rudolf Hurst, written when he was in jail in Poland prior to being hanged. So it's his account of his life, his involvement with the National Socialist Party, his involvement with the concentration camp system in Auschwitz, and it's his um, uh, sterilised version of his life, where he's, he's, um, <laughs> very he's tried to redeem himself. So he wasn't very candid, he kind of missed no, no. a few things out. Yeah. He was kind of like, well... But it, but it is his account. The, yeah. There are faults in the account and there are untruths in the account, but it is his account, and he wrote it fairly enthusiastically and spoke quite willingly to British investigators, to Polish investigators. He American. Uh, American. He gave evidence at the Nuremberg trial, so he wasn't a defendant at the Nuremberg trial. He was a man who gave evidence um, against the, the main defendants in the first trial. Okay. So you read these books, you, you ran off. Who did you go to stay with? Was it just a... Did, it, did you make yourself homeless? Did you... I don't know. But did, do you have family members no. that you could go... I was in training in that time to became a cook. Okay. And my boss, but which I didn't know in that time, he was also a product of the Second World War. He was a kid out of the Lebensborn. Okay. So Lebensborn is like a breeder home with blue eyes, blonde hairs, stuff like that. Yeah. So he never met his father. He only had a mother, blunt, blue-eyed. Yeah. And he helped me. He said, I know who you are. I know the stuff about Auschwitz. I know all that business around. Yeah. So, and he became my closest friend until he passed away in 2015. That's really amazing. And, you know, it, it absolutely fascinates me how how Germany just goes on living after the Second World War. You know, how, how the perceptions on, on things that happened. And, you know, your story must be amongst a few hundreds, thousands, maybe of people have just done horrific things you know, that you've got to live with, the rest of the family you've got to live with after generation after generation, you know. So did you meet many people that have been through similar experiences as you, you know, family members that have done horrendous things because of the war? I think a close friend became uh, Niklas Frank, yeah. the son of the general governor of, po of occupied Poland. Then I met uh, Bettina Göring, the grandniece of Hermann Göring. Yeah. Yeah. And how did how did he deal with that? How do, how do you deal with something like this? On the beginning, it was really, really strange, difficult. Yeah. Well, I have to find my way. So in it, I went up on the beginning when I left my home in drugs and alcohol, criminal activities on roads. <laughs> we all had lives. We all had lives. <laughs> yeah. But then I became a father in the age of 17. Fantastic. Yeah. And everything has changed immediately. Yeah. Good. I'm glad you managed. I'm, I'm really glad you managed to piece something together out of all this because there's some people's minds that just wouldn't be able to cope with that kind of information. You know, you can just imagine it. You know, um, and wh when was it when you decided that you were going to take this this destiny of yours, this 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 uh, history and everything that you know your grandfather was responsible for, and make try and make a difference, start trying to change things for the better. I think it was clear from the beginning. Yeah. It was my path. Yeah. From the beginning in the family. Well, my grandmother always said, uh, you're not a true Hurst. We can't trust you. See, that's crazy because, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to speak bad about your family. Not at all. I, don't, I wouldn't <laughs> want to can. do that. But, I have no problem with it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just not in my nature. But at the same time, it's kind of like, well, how can you look at these things and not be horrified? You know, how can... Surely all of your family members should be doing the same thing you're doing. That's the point I'm trying to make. I think it, it, it is until today horrifying for me. Yeah. When I go to Auschwitz and I was no more than 30 times in Auschwitz with over 4,000 students. Yeah. I need time. And I think Simon knows it. He was with me there on the 70th anniversary. And it was an impact. It was really a media impact there. They take no notice about the survivors. No. That was really things which I don't really like. So I have to stay away from survivors in the same in the same moment. Mm. Yes, it must be really difficult. Well, we we had to do that on the seventieth anniversary. It was a major media, media event. The world's press were there in their thousands, and the focus should have been on the survivors. And we were very conscious of that. There were probably three hundred survivors at Auschwitz for that event. 
the most that there are, will ever be again because sadly their, their numbers are diminishing and to have all uh, an abundance of press attention on Reina felt wrong for all of us uh, when there were survivors there whose yeah. story was probably more powerful and more relevant I guess I guess it's the ratio of things, isn't it? You know, and this isn't meant in any disrespectful. I'm not making any sort of dig or anything like that. But you know, the the, the survivors, you know, they've gone on and made their generations, and they've grown. You know, whereas people like yourself, like they've probably come really slim numbers. I imagine, like you know, so they're kind of like, oh, this is the jewel in the crown. What's it like to? be the product of a monster or whatever whatever words they want to spin on it you know the press work um you know so i guess that's probably why but you shouldn't be doing that you know these people that the families that went through what they went through went through horrendous things they've got amazing stories and like you said in your in your first interview with us like the, the stories that you've heard are but just you know i can't imagine just can't imagine so yeah you, it's wrong it is wrong but i can understand why if that makes sense that you know what i'm trying to say there is a flip side as well yeah. because Reiner has um, made it almost a mission to campaign against the hate that existed during the period of National Socialism yeah. and if possessing the name Hearst and being descended from the Commandant of Auschwitz can be used as a tool to be given a voice, to be heard by yes. the press, to be heard by the media, to be allowed to speak in front of audiences, yeah, to, to be a student. weapon. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it makes sense to me because like, I imagine like... I, when you go around around Auschwitz, is is your grandfather's name everywhere? Oh, of course. Yeah, is it like? Is it he's, like yeah. he's the symbol there. So people know that name because of Auschwitz. When you when you mention his name, it's like oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, but you, you you won't see his name written around Auschwitz, but the whole essence and existence of Auschwitz is him. Yeah. What was it like for you going? I don't know how intricately you kind of when you go to Auschwitz, how how um, detailed your, your your walks around are. Do you have you been to the quarters where he used to live, for example? Have you been to his office, things like that? You know. I think I'm I'm the only one right now who was in the villa. Yeah. So everything was in the garden, which the party is still existing right now, and I know every centimeter in Auschwitz. Yeah. And I know as well these spots, which is not in public right now. Mm. What's that feeling like when you stood there in the same room that your grandfather operated in? Well, what's your feelings like when you stood in there? How do how I explain that feeling? It it puts my heart pressure up. Mm. Well, I know, so Simon knows it. I can't touch anything there. So mm. when you see me going inside, my hands goes immediately in my pockets. So I don't touch anything. Why not? I will not have a connection with my grandfather. No. I will not have... I, I know it sounds a little bit stupid. Not, no, not at all. But I will not have any any stuff from, from, from his side on my fingers. I will not be part of his slaughtering, of his brutality. I like that. I mean, you are, you are in his... I mean, if you and your grandfather lived at the same time, at the same age right now, you'd be his nemesis, wouldn't you? Yeah, you know, that's the that's the way to look at it. But I but I feel him with every step. I'm inside Auschwitz. I feel him. It's like he's sitting and breathing me in my neck and sitting in a backpack. Mm. So in the beginning, I was really scared when I was the first time there with my mom. Well, she asked me, "Would you take me with you?" I said, "Of course, no problem." And we went together there, and it was unbelievable for both of us. My mom really she was a strong woman, but she went on her knees said, oh, God, I didn't know what he was creating here. Um, um, that, oh, God. Sorry, I'm getting a bit torn up because I'm just putting myself, I'm a bit of an empath, right? So I'm putting myself in, in that situation and I'm thinking that must have been such a raw feeling, such a powerful yeah. moment for for, for my mom. For it, was, mom. it was really heavy where she became asthma. Yeah. She was standing inside. She couldn't breathe, heart problems. And I was not aware if, if she collapses me. Yeah. That's um, yeah. That's that. That's quite. That's quite. Speaks for itself. Sorry, I got lost for words. Then, um, <laughs> how's how's t how's time um, affected this with your family? Are you still absolutely no word with them, or are, are you still since nineteen eighty five no contact? None at all. That's, that must be that must be hard for you. My mom was the last the last one I had contact, and she passed away last year. Crazy. 
Crazy, crazy, crazy. And what is it, since you started campaigning, I'm going very public about this, you know, uh, what's the reaction been like both for the Nazi supporters out there around the world? We know they exist, we know they're there, and uh, the Nazi haters. Have you had a lot of support out of um, the haters, or do, do they hate you for, I don't know, what's it, what's it been like for you? Which which campaign you mean? The Swedish? Okay, let me reword that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you're, you're campaigning against the far right. Yeah. yeah so, was, what sort of reaction have you had? Different different reactions. I never get uh, clear confronted by by right wingers. So they always come in the night. They painted swastikas on my car. Really? Yeah. They sent me images of my kids where they cut it out the the eyes, and said they are the next. That must be horrific. Yeah. That's terrible. And how do you cope with that? That, that, was, that's, that sounds like it's barbaric. I was, for, for myself, I was clear nothing will happen. These, these guys are coward. They never do anything. They come like rats in the night, and they still do. Yeah. It sounds, sounds horrific, especially when you've got kids yourself, you know. That was, that was the only problem we, we had in, our, uh, in the family. That I took my kids out of everything. Yeah. So nobody really saw my kids. Never know anybody the name of my kids. Yeah, keep yourself to yourself. Yeah. And I and I said I said it to my kids. So then they they were real aware about what their great grandfather did. My job is. And I said, if you're interested in to go in public, I leave it up to you. Um, it's your choice. Do your family get the same treatment? The ones you don't speak to, do they do they still get no that? no no. But I, I lead them into that these kind of treatments. Yeah? Yeah. I told a lot of journalists, good journalists, friend of mine, Thomas Harding, yeah. where my family live. So he immediately traveled to the States, to Washington, D.C., to my aunt, and knocked her down. <laughs> good. That's really nice. Because like, you're, you're campaigning now for the opposite side of that. So what kind of reaction do you get off the people that, you know, survivors for example do they immediately know who you are now or is it a case of you have to explain yourself i have two experience Sorry. one survivor passed away a few weeks ago hmm. eva moses core she adopted me wow she said okay it's uh, your grandfather never enjoyed you but i did <laughs> and it's my revenge against him it was a symbolic adoption yeah, a symbolic adoption but still very poignant, very emotional. Oh, that's quite cool. The other one is uh, Ben Lesser from Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And we became really, really close friends. But it was a, a situation, it was the first survivor who looked about me. So no emails, nothing else. And he, he read an article in the Wall Street Journal about me. Wow. Yeah. And he said he couldn't believe. He was shattered. Said, "What's going on? A hiss on the on the front page of the Wall Street Journal." <laughs> then, then he read the whole article and said, "Okay, I have to meet this guy." He went to his uh, daughter Gail and said, "Okay, look for look for him, find out where he lives." And two yeah. days later, we had a long conversation on phone. Amazing, amazing. And we are still mm. in in a good friend and relationship. I. He wrote a book as well like I did. And I made it happen that that book was published in France. <laughs> and a few weeks ago, we were together in France. And it was the first time for me to speak in a memorial, like the Museum de la Shoah in Paris. Yeah. And the head of there, uh, Mr. Boyer, said, incredible story. A survivor and the grandson of that guy who treated him so unwell. Stand together, sit together, and thinking the same doing the same it is it is kind of it's one of those things you don't expect from a family member and that it, it's good it's really good i'm saying that you know because a lot of like your other the rest of your family they kind of you meant to family's family right so you, you meant to stick behind your family regardless of of what they've done so for, for someone to be like nah actually do you know what you can i, I don't want to be part of this that's quite that's quite yeah. unique um so that that's why you are unique and you are you are worth contacting what's it like um say say for example now we're, we're on the way out steve next door he's been to auschwitz before said it was, it was really eerie and emotional for him but say i said oh 
this this is who you are and his dad his granddad was the the commandant of, of Auschwitz where you went do you is that is that can that be really annoying for you because then you have to explain put into context no I think it's part of my work yeah oh so that's that's nice that's really cool I mean obviously you you, you need the right to some yeah. privacy and relaxation and, and of neutral. course yeah, but of we, course. we were at Cosford earlier today chatting to a woman who is English but had spent a lot of time living in Germany and we were talking about the current political situation in Europe, in Britain, in America. And I looked at Ryan and said, um, shall I tell her who you are? <laughs> and said, of course. And she, she was astonished, but warmly astonished, to have that link to the country that she lived in, that she loved, but also to the history uh, and the politics of today and, the, and being with someone who was in a position to challenge some of the hate and intolerance that really poisons our world today. So it, it, it was beneficial to her. And she went away with, uh, Ryan mentioned Ben Lesser, the guy who read the Wall Street Journal. Ben has a foundation called the Zahor Holocaust Remembrance Foundation. Zahor is a Hebrew word for remember. And he, we gave her a badge, which you've now got. Oh my God, that's, I saw this on the documentary. Yeah. I'm actually smiling from ear to ear now. This is amazing. So that was the parting gift for her. So she's met the grandson, she understands the grandson, and she has that as well. That's amazing. And how did you two meet? What's the story there? We, we um, <laughs> contacted each other via social media back in 2013, 2014. So it was a long time ago. 12, 12. 12, quite 12. possibly. And then um, conversed and conversed and conversed and started Skype conversations. And um, we were linked in with a couple of other people, uh, an American and a, a British woman. And we pondered the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz and what we could do about it. And one was to be there, because it was an important event, yeah. but also to use that event constructively, which is where we decided to set up Footsteps, initially as a Facebook page and website, but with a view to creating something more important. So we've been working closely together for a number of years, sharing ideas, planning, trying to be creative in how we can try and challenge hate responsibly without obviously sitting... Um, with one political camp or another yeah. political camp, not ally to any politicians or well, parties. Well, it's, it's up to everyone to learn about this, isn't it? You mm. can't, you can't just be like, well, actually, you know, I'm very right wing. I won't say I'm an activist, so, but you know, you should still learn about these things because mm. otherwise, you got, you're going to use to back up yourself. And you work hard, man. You, you are everywhere. I see you doing talks here, there, and everywhere. You're currently working on new material for your new book now as well. So, mm. you know, you work extensively. And a lot of your work is connected with Reiner, you know, yeah. yeah, communicate a lot together. Whenever I give a talk, it'll be about the Holocaust, it'll be about the Second World War, but it will be a talk that um, always carries a message of look at the lessons of history and make sure you learn them. Look at the language that was used in the Holocaust, look at the, the attitudes of the powerful people to the uh, less powerful people and how... Um, hate was facilitated and enabled and look at the world today and look at the language used today and look at who the targets are change jew to muslim to refugee to asylum seeker to, um, to mexican yeah and i was going to ask you about that actually i was going to ask you about you know um, and, and we wrote a book together yeah a booklet Booklet. You always call it a booklet. It's yeah. just a small book. It's yeah. a small book. Yeah. <laughs> if it was a, if it was a fictional, it'd be called a novel. Um, but it's really nice that you've got that relationship with each other. You know, because you know, there's lots that are coming out of it, and not just we're not just talking about reading materials. We're talking about education, things that be lessons that we can teach people about the rhetoric of hate and, like you said, the language that keeps coming back because uh, everybody sees it. Everybody sees it. Everybody sees it again and again and again. But what are people doing about it? I think when, when you're looking right now now to America and you look to England and you see these blondes, I don't use the word right now, <laughs> which I always use, but it begins with air. <laughs> For me, it's that's exactly what happens in 1933. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And people who are using their pollution in a bad way. Yeah. And it, these detention centers in America, I, I understand the problem. I understand we all know what the problem is. And, you know, you know, fair, but, but, you know, build your wall. Go ahead, build your wall. But don't throw people in centers where with rooms that are made for 30 people and throw 300 people in there. 
you know, where children are dying and people aren't eating. And I think the best will be he built a wall around himself. Yes, I think so. I mean, then the world is free of him. I, I just I don't like to get like super political on the show. I was, I mean, we had um, Extinction Rebellion on the show a couple of uh, a couple of weeks ago, and. Um, Running up to that show, I was kind of like, <laughs> "How do I approach this about you know taking one side or the other?" Because even though I've got my own my my own like you know um, things that I prefer and my own way of thinking about politics, it's still better to cover these things. This is why I love having you guys on. I just need to put it in a way where I'm not looking like I'm going. I am very left wing. I'm very right wing, but well. you know. But the message is still the same. Hate is hate, right? Mm. Exactly. And what you're talking about now is the the language that I've been used today and the way people are going about things is is very hateful. Oh, of course. And and look at the language that is used and compare it to not just the Holocaust but every other genocide where the victims are dehumanized. Yeah. They're dehumanized by referring to them as cockroaches, as vermin, as infestations, as a cancer, as an invasion. That takes Aliens, them, yeah. it takes away the humanity of people who are often very needy or who are vulnerable or or, or who are just our neighbours. If you dehumanise people, it becomes easy to harm them. Every genocide, they dehumanise people. And every genocide, you can look back at the, that period of time and see where the warnings were glaring out and people did nothing. Yeah. Um, and we have lots of warning signals being flashed now and a lot of people are doing nothing. We, we need to be alert. We need to be alert to the propaganda we're hearing. We need to be alert to false messages that are coming from politicians that are yeah. provably wrong that incite hatred. We need to be alert to the the hate mongers on social media who you know, I won't even bother naming, you know, who you know the people I mean. Yeah. Um because they, they reach a wide audience and that wide audience, a lot of them will just take that message on board without challenge. And we I've just seen a documentary as well on Netflix where um adverts on things like th on Facebook and things like that are being tailor made um for you to push you over to a different way of thinking by making adverts that are tailored for you. To, or pop-ups or videos mm. or things that are trying to, just to try and move you to one from one side. They say what they called um, the people are just in between. They're not right. They're not left. They're just kind of I don't know. They'll then show you lots of videos and things that are, that will try and persuade you to move over to the right or to the left. And so, like you're saying that, but they're they're very clever about it. <laughs> very very clever about it. The proper it's not just propaganda right now. It's it's very technological how they do it, and it's scary. Really scares the hell out of me. It really does. Um, but it works the same way as Nazi propaganda. If you repeat a message enough times, much, much faster it, in modern days. Yeah, mm. it becomes believable. You don't need the mass rallies of the Nazi era. You don't need um, every home to have a radio set of the Nazi era. You've got everyone in a house um, on an iPhone or an iPad or on a laptop looking at Facebook, looking at Twitter, looking at Instagram, and having these adverts and targeted messages. Um, on their screen, mm, and yeah. if you read that target, targeted message enough times, you think mm, that might be true. Yeah. You don't investigate. People don't investigate in the way they would have done of reading books, of checking the sources of the author of a book and seeing where those sources are from, whether they're reputable, whether they've actually got an agenda. You, people just receive the information on their screen and accept it unchallenged. Um, you know, we, we need to be alert. Propaganda has changed. Methodology has changed. Its impact is the same. Its impact is probably even more effective now. Yeah. And what can we do to... I mean, I know you're making footsteps. I, I guess it's, it's footsteps made for survivors of the Holocaust, or is there a deeper message there that can be... It, it goes beyond the Holocaust. The Holocaust was our starting the point. The main focus. Yeah, because of Reiner's heritage. Yeah, absolutely. And absolutely. the link to Auschwitz. And footsteps, a word, really means walking on the, the selection ramp at foot. Uh, Auschwitz yeah. in the footsteps of people who died. And it was not made to promote ourselves. No. So to get a wider audience while I'm the grandson. Yeah. yeah. I think it's it's our main interest. Yeah. But it's 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 looking beyond the nineteen thirties and nineteen forties. Yeah. It's looking at other genocides, it's looking at attitudes, it's looking at finding a way through social media and through website and through giving talks and interviews of spreading that message, of getting people to challenge hate, look at the message they're, messages they're receiving from multiple sources, looking at um, questioning that information, looking at being inquisitive, looking at being curious, looking at seeing your fellow human beings as human, not as the vermin, the cockroaches, the cancers, the invasions that the, the haters would have you believe. Um, yeah. So it, we, we, 
currently it's a Facebook page and a website, and there are four or five of us involved in, in footsteps, myself, Reina, Simona in Holland, um, Inger in, in Germany, Inger in Germany Giuseppe. Giuseppe in Germany, um, Jess yeah. in England. So we're a handful of people who will all use whatever means we can to spread information, to get people to think. Um, and, and we're looking to different spots. Yeah. So Giuseppe, our Italian guy, so he lives in Germany, but he is uh, an Italian, and he's gay. Yeah. So oh, in Italy as well. Yeah. yeah. And he wrote an article about what happens in the Second World War with gay people. What happens today? I saw I saw uh, a link on your on your thing. What the the, the, the hidden truth about you know the yeah, deaths right. of gay people? Yeah. Yeah. Because there was there was it wasn't just Jews, was it? There was rather those gypsies. There was there was gay people. It was people. everything who was against the National Socialist yeah. Party. Yeah. Terrible. And the National Socialist bit, it's, it's one thing I always have to make a point of. You will hear misinformed people say, oh, National Socialist was socialist, because it's in their name. They purloined the word socialist because it would attract various supporters of other workers' parties in the upheaval of post-First World War Germany. Their main enemy from the outset was socialist. When Dachau opened in 1933, the first inmates were socialists, were communists, were trade unionists. They weren't a socialist party. It was, it was used to try and attract people who may have been drawn to socialism and communism. Crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. And uh, deceptive. Very deceptive. Um, so how is it going with, with Footsteps? You say, how long has it been, like, official now? Oh, since 2014. Yeah, because we were talking about it before, weren't yeah. we? And how much have you guys done to sort of, sort of help people with with what you're doing? Because you know you're saying you don't want to self promote. I think you should actually just think just going <laughs> completely off topic there. You've got a name that that sends alarm bells ringing. Use that. Stand on on a plinth and be like, I am such and such from such and such. This is what happened, and this is what we're doing. Make those ears prick up. You know, you you are a product, sir. And it sounds like a really horrible thing to say, but you are a product. <laughs> Use your product to to promote what you are trying well, to promote. Well, our, our aim ultimately. Uh, hopefully in the not too distant future is to be a not-for-profit foundation yeah and that will give us uh, more scope to do more work um, yeah we n we never ask for donations yeah so everything we do is getting out of our own pocket yeah well it's education isn't it you know it's uh, not just education you know you're there i think it, it Being is there education for so <laughs> i'm i'm going in germany right now in 70 to 80 schools a year yeah and not only for an hour it's sometimes a whole whole day or three four days yeah but yeah. it's not belonging to the teachers or the directors it belongs to the students the last meeting i had for before summer holidays in germany i was there and i was booked for one and a half day and the, the students came and said could you stay longer we yeah. have so many questions and who will give us the answer yeah. if not you um there's a, there's a few bright so i mean a lot of people talk about the way we use entertainment these days, you know, the Kardashians and the YouTubes and the, the game streaming and things like that, but there are some bright sparks out there. And, I'm, you know, I see so many young people at the moment that uh, give me a lot of faith <laughs> for the future. Yeah, of course, the, the youngsters are the main focus, especially for me. Yeah. Well, these, these kids sometimes raise our country. Yeah. They became politicians, mm. attorneys and stuff like that who saved the country. So how can they stand up for a country where they have no knowledge about the history of their country? Yeah, absolutely. Who, who totally ignore agree. 12 years of fascism yeah. and a bad fascism. Yeah, and it's, it's still going on around the world as well, North Korea, um, you know, all that mess that's going on there. Um, yeah. There's stuff going on in Hungary at the moment now that's mm. just absolutely... Uh, it's Hungary. You don't expect to see it in Hungary. You know, there's in America. America is right in front of our face. It's right in front of our face. And what are yeah. people here? Yeah. It's interesting to say about um, younger people. If you talk to Holocaust survivors who, who have taken it upon themselves to give public speeches and to yeah. be involved in education, and many of them have, invariably they'll say they prefer talking to young people. They prefer talking to teenagers because they listen and they try and understand. Whereas adult audiences, particularly if they're over forty or fifty, are disinterested. Yeah, and they it's think the upcoming they know it generation. All. Yeah, young people ask questions. I, I've, give, I've given many talks to adult audiences. I was invited to help with Holocaust education to some year ten children, recent, year six children recently, so age ten or eleven. They got it. They absolutely understood the Holocaust, and they understood about 
the need to stand up against hate, against bullying, against intolerance, against prejudice. The words they used uh, in postcards that they wrote to, them, to themselves for later life were phenomenal. These were 10 and 11 year olds, they got it. Um, I don't think I'd have got that from an adult audience. I think it's coming. I think something's coming soon. And I don't want to sound like I'm so conspiracy theorist, but there's a lot of language used on social media right now where, you know, people are being stood up for, you know. And then there's all this craziness that's gone on recently about Area 51. Let's storm Area 51. Let's get those aliens, yo. You know, this, this is, it was absolutely crazy. The celebrities getting on board with it and everything. I was like, yeah, the passion's great. The desire is fantastic. And the... Whatever, but let's just steer it a little bit and put it at the detention centres on the border. Let's just do that instead of Area Fifty One. Who cares what's going on there? That's you know, let's, let's save some some people. Um, so like, things are changing, I guess. You know, um, and you guys seem like you, you're doing your part to try and you know. I think we we change a lot of a yeah, lot of people. Sounds like mm. you do. Yeah, right now. Yeah. When when I see our followers on on Facebook, when I see the followers on our website. When I see how many people get in contact with us, not only well, how 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 could I call myself a big shot or something like that? I don't know if if that's the right word. We get we get some lovely messages, usually private messages of our email, um, where people are just um, proud to be trying to do something and to let us know, <laughs> to let us know that they understand that they care, and that's that's quite warming. We were in. Um, we're, Ryan is obviously always in Germany, but we were in Germany last year for the... Um, you said it very resentful that he's yeah, always, in Germany. always in Germany. He never comes to see me. <laughs> we, we, we as a whole team, uh, <laughs> we as a whole team were in... in yeah, we were in Germany for the um, uh, Holocaust uh, Memorial Day, 27th of January, in the Black Forest, with Reiner and with Ben Lesser, the survivor he mentioned who's from last week. We invited him. And it was one of the most magical events where... Um, Ben and Reiner gave her a number of talks, but one talk was in a hall in a small town called Bad Liebenzell. And in that hall, during the 1940s, Nazis held rallies. So we have an event in this hall where there were 600... Oh, over, nearly 700. Nearly 700 people in there, mainly young Germans. Um, and it was the place where I got trained as a cook. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So an audience mainly of young Germans. Reiner takes to the stage, the grandson of the Commandant of Auschwitz, and introduces his good friend, the survivor of the crimes of the Commandant of Auschwitz, who also survived other camps, and then Ben spoke for an hour in English. Thankfully, most of the audience could understand what he's saying. And he related his story from childhood in Poland through to fleeing to Hungary, through to being detained, ending up in Auschwitz, uh, Dachau, and then America. And at the end of his talk, he asked everyone to hold hands with the person next to him and just repeat the words, never again, never again, never again. And he finished his speech. The room erupted. 700 Germans in a hall where the Nazis had held rallies listening to the grandson of the Commandant of Auschwitz and a survivor of the crimes of the Nazis and the emotion was uh, just overwhelming and then there was a queue to the end of the hall of all these young people wanting to um, meet the survivor of the camp it's quite magical and at that point you realize the Nazis lost because these young Germans were embracing the survivor they were proud to be with the survivor. They were proud with the hope that he was instilling in them. That's nice. It is nice. And thank you. Thank you for thank you for doing that because without the, the it, it wouldn't be not possible without people like like Simon. Both uh, it wouldn't. Yeah, yes. Yeah, you si can't Simon, do it alone. That's impossible. With you, I guess you were kind of born into it. You just kind of like, okay, this is my life now. Whereas with Simon, there was a desire there to find this out, to learn about this, and to put your education and everything you've learned into something good. And thank you both, you know, all three of you. <laughs> There's another chat that you sat next to me. Um, uh, you know, because what you're doing is you're you're taking the next generation and you're trying to teach them the lessons. But <laughs> you are trying to teach them the lessons um, about the past and what we've done before and what we've continued to do. But my question is, and it's going to sound really kind of dark and really negative, but I'm really sorry. But do you think, okay, so there's a cat next door, right? And he just kills birds, leaves them on the lawn, buggers off, doesn't eat them, kills for fun. Do you think it's in us a desire to kill for fun? To um, 
to be a we're a cruel race. Do you think that's inbuilt in us, or do you think it's something? I, my background, as you know, previously was in mental health care yeah. and, and working with criminals. And I would say that most people who do dreadful things have been nurtured that way. They've been created. Situations yeah. have occurred in their life that take away their ability for empathy, sympathy, oh. compassion. Um, so I don't think we're innately cruel, but we have the facility and ability to be cruel. Um, it's inherited. If, again, look at every genocide. Good, decent, normal people became abhorrent vile, violent, cruel criminals. Yeah. You know, someone who would just normally be a shopkeeper or a milkman or a factory worker would happily put on a uniform or pick up a panga or a machete uh, and you know, dismember their neighbour or force neighbours onto trains or into camps. Or, you know. I think it's, it's part of the society as well. They create criminals. Yeah. So if you, when I see it in Germany, so we have Muslims, we have refugees, they place them in... I call it camps in suburbs. Yeah. Completely away from the society, from the normal life. What did they expect what happens on the end of the day? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh... Did they become citizen of Germany? No. They follow their own rules. They must survive. Hmm. I don't know. It just, I, it, that sounded like a really sceptical thing to say, but it's got to be asked. It's got to be asked. Like, uh, do we kill for fun? And, uh, you know, is it something that's inbred, inbred into us? You know, I think, you know, it definitely, absolutely, 100% helps what you guys are doing. Um, but, you know, without you guys, without you guys, just say we just left it up to the education system. Do they do enough? There needs to be consistency in, in Holocaust education particularly, and that Holocaust education has to include the others who died during that period yeah. of time. So six million Jews, but with five million others, the Roma, Sinti, Jehovah Witnesses, political opponents, homosexuals, and all the others. People need to be aware of that. Um, it needs to be taught in context with other gen genocides in the world today. And there needs to be a structure to it. Holocaust education is taught at Key Stage 3 in the United Kingdom, but it's not clearly prescribed who's going to teach it what age it's going to be taught at for how long what the aims and objectives are so that needs to be consistent and we need really consistency europe-wide but also in countries like america and australia and south america everywhere that it, people need to understand that period of history they need to understand about other genocides they need to understand about war and perhaps in some areas of the world it needs to be the wars that are more relevant to their geographical area if you're in east asia um, the concept of the European wars is that they're almost irrelevant because they didn't have an impact. I think the most, the most astonishing thing about all this is, is like, we can talk about Genghis Khan, you can talk about um, the Vikings, you can talk about the, you know, the Romans and what they did to people across Europe with, with picture books and drawings, but there is evidence, there's pictures, there's videos, there's just footage of what happened in, in these concentration camps around the world. So but we like, have deniers. We yeah, have people but, yeah. who deny the Holocaust. Mm. It's crazy. So I worked for years to get the uh, war criminals on trial. Oskar Gröning, the bookkeeper. Yeah. I worked for years that he get judged. And it was it was really a, a heavy work to get survivors on on the platform. Because said, uh, in Germany we don't think something happens. Yeah. So they are really losing hope in that moment. Mm. What happened to a lot of the people that were arrested for these atrocities? Did they get executed? Did, did, did they all get executed? Did they are there still some in prison now? I don't know. How does it work? Most got fairly short. Those that weren't executed got fairly short sentences, or they were given lengthy sentences and then the sentences but were it's, reduced. It's nearly a percent. Yeah. The, the problem, in part, the, the multiple factors come into play in Europe, particularly, that um, the looming presence of the Soviet forces in Eastern Europe and, and the eastern half of Germany which it meant eventually became the Cold War, the um, number of criminals that needed to be investigated and arrested were beyond the scope of the Allied forces. There were too many to find and too many to process and prosecute. They couldn't do it. Uh, so they focused on a few and then eventually really lost interest. There was an element that some former Nazis were actually quite useful to Western allies. Well, look at NASA. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Von Braun, oh, von Braun was, um, led the, the Apollo... Yeah. Mission, yeah, he's yeah, yeah, yeah. ahead of it. Um, some were used as spies. Klaus Barbie was employed by the Americans as a spy, yeah. um, even though the French had sentenced him to death in absentia. Um, Alois Brunner. Yeah. And Barbie, the Americans actually gave him false papers and, and moved him to Bolivia. Wow. Werner von Braun. Yeah. Yeah. 
So he went to America and he creates the next atom bomb, which destroys uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yeah. And look, there's a fine line, isn't there? You know, it's like, well, don't shoot me. I'll do what you tell me to. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll follow your laws and things like that. And then there's a fine line between that and going, oh, yeah. Well, what's that you're telling us to do? Let's do that. Sounds great. You know, there's a, I guess there's, you've got to adapt, haven't you? Otherwise you end up shot. Yeah. Well, people weren't at risk of being shot. That, there's an element of myth there. Um, Goebbels used to talk about um, moving, using propaganda to go at the uh, pace of the slowest ship in the convoy. And that you just repeat the message until the slowest slower ship catches up so you, you don't have to threaten you just have to repeat that information until gradually more and more people make up the numbers in the Bra convoy. brainwashing yeah yeah well brainwashing was what yeah. i was going to ask about as well you know because we were talking about um <laughs> you nearly made me cry by the way when we talked about um the boy with the striped pajamas we were talking about he was like <laughs> well that kid would have been dead in two hours i was like what um but there's a there's a lot in that about um the young girl in there and she's like reading all the school books and things like that and they just they got like nazis on the front cover and it's all you could tell it was just like designed to to, to brainwash like you say um that must have taken years for germany to to get rid of right well i mean mm -hmm. you can't suddenly turn around and go oh you know everything that you've just been learning for the last sort of you know seven eight years in school it was it was i was gonna say the b word then but it's uh it was wrong <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. Was that indoctrination? Indoctrination, yeah. If if you said to someone for years he's a stupid person, yeah, on the end he believes he's a stupid person. Yeah, you can crash someone, slap him verbal mm. for years, then you slap someone. Mm. You break you you completely break his personality. Yeah, and that's exactly what happens in Germany. Yeah. Ah. It just always fascinates me. Like, you know, I've got an American co-host and the little things that get lost in translation, the way he does life, the way I do life, and the way Germany does life. And like, especially after the war, it's always fascinated me, like kind of how things just went back to normal. I mean, it didn't go back to normal. The country was split in two. But, you know, it's just like, how do you, how do you go from that to that, you know? Um, I guess it must have been really difficult, especially for you. You know, you have to run away from your family, you know? Yeah. I'm, I never have a remorse about it. No. If... If they not turn around in the way that they said, okay, he was a war criminal and not that glorifying war hero. Well, he was anything else than a war hero. Yeah, he was a criminal. He was a mass murder. Yeah, it would have been nice if they just sat you down, and went, sit down, son. I yeah. got something to tell you. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense to me. And what? Well, so you're in Shrewsbury at the moment. How long have you been in Shrewsbury? Or you've been about until the 18th. Yeah, you've been here for a few days now. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Well, in, in so, the region, really, too. Yeah. So we're staying in Wolverhampton. Oh, right. Yeah. Poor, poor soul. I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> he comes from Wolverhampton. Be careful. Oh, that's fine. He'll understand. <laughs> and, he um. has, and he has a stick. <laughs> uh, do you come to Shrewsbury often? You enjoy it? Yeah. Yeah. The town here. It's yeah. nice, isn't oh, it? Oh, it's, it's really nice. It's a beautiful place to come. Um, and it's you know it's an absolute pleasure to meet you, Simon. Thank you so much for bringing this to my house. <laughs> this is great. My uh, pleasure. Um, I had like because we had like you told me a few days about a few days ago about this, and I was like, oh, uh, uh, okay, uh, we need to sort something out. And I, I wanted to do this in like a coffee shop. We could have done this in front of people easily and charged two pound on the door. People would have loved it. You know, that's the kind of that's what you bring to the table. So with footnotes or oh, footstep, foot, footstep, footstep. footstep. <laughs> <laughs> my mind is gone it's broken with footsteps use what you've got there because yeah. that's you've probably been told that before by smarter people than me um <laughs> um i was gonna say last thing story of god documentary i've just watched a bit of it <laughs> with morgan freeman yeah what was that like i mean the, the footage looked very raw to me it looked very like oh my god this is this is real <laughs> it looks very uh, difficult for you Mm, not not really. For me, it was really an honor to meet Thomas Krauss. Yeah. To be invited by Morgan Freeman and his team. Yeah. To be there a couple of days in ter Terezin. Did you meet Morgan? Yeah. Yeah? What's it's, he like? He's a cool guy. Yeah? Yeah. Good. That's what I wanted to hear because I love Morgan Freeman. <laughs> <laughs> if you just said, mm, mm, mm. Yeah, it would have me. But no, it's good. But I think it was another message as well. Yeah. Very, very important message. So yeah. Thomas, Thomas' father was the first one who got deported from Terezin to Auschwitz. He survived. Yeah. So in 75 years later, I stand together with, with his son and me on a, on a cruelty place. 
Yeah. The, the the when you when you were speaking and you were just had you met previous to that or you know had you met and had a conversation before they put the cameras on you or was that no. the first time you'd actually walked? It was and shook the him? first time I saw him. Yeah, because it sounded like when you were to, like talking to each other, um, you it sounded like he was trying to weigh you up a little bit. He was kind of like, no, I think we had the same task. I was in range yeah. as well, like him. Yeah. So we know each other by by males. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but the team itself didn't give us any chance to communicate. No. So it's just kind of like, yeah, they wanted to get the capture of the moment, and this is what I'm on about. It looked yeah. a bit awkward. No, I won't say awkward. It's just like, what's the best way to describe this, Simon? Because that, it, looked, see, it, it looked unrehearsed. It, yeah, yeah, unrehearsed is the word I'm looking for, but it looked raw. It looked very raw. So when you saw Hitler's children, it was the first time that I met some Jewish kids from Israel. Yeah. And they really didn't understood Germany. So they get told in, in Israel, don't go to Germany. They're full of Nazis. Oh, right, okay. When then you went in and uh, they had no clue, I had no clue what happens next. Yeah. It was not planned. That part in the film was not planned. Yeah, and that's that's nice. In a way, that's good. They wanted to capture that, and that was made for a reason. National mm. Geographic, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's all about life and those those things you have to deal with. That, that, that was an amazing thing for for Morgan Freeman's team to do. But, and I would uh, definitely recommend it. It's uh, it's on YouTube. Um, it's a National Geographic um, documentary, and it's called The Story of God. And explains the sins, what people have done over and over again. Like we said, this this kind of this language, this rhetoric that's that's repeated over and over again. And he meets people that are either victims of or have been around those certain sins, those yeah. ultimate sins that people have made. De- deadly sins, it's mm. called. Yeah, terrible. Thank you so much for coming on my show. Thank you. We invited. Uh, <laughs> it was amazing to meet you. And you know, <laughs> if you are if with, with with footsteps, if there's anything we can do. If there's anything that's in Shrewsbury, anywhere, I don't care. We do Shrewsbury Biscuit, but this is really important to me. If there's anything anywhere you want me to advertise on my social media, talk about on my show, you get in touch, sir, and you'll be on my priority list because this is really important. And I, I genuinely, I, I thank you on behalf of all my listeners, my friends, my family, everyone, like for, for doing this and, and teaching young people that it's not acceptable to hate, regardless. There is no need. Yeah. Not only in acceptance, there is no need to hate. Yeah. Do you encourage people to get in touch with you? Um, is, yeah. there, is there anywhere people can find you if they want to get in touch? Yeah. Yeah. Um, let people know where you are at then. Do you want to... and the best contact to contact Ryan or Footsteps yeah. as a, a whole, if uh, whichever people prefer, is via the website. So www.footstepsonline.com and there's a link for yeah. emails email. if people want to send them. Fantastic. Because I bet, I bet people, I bet there's a. The hundreds of thousands of people with stories up there that you people just haven't spoken to people you know um it'd be nice to get all those sorts of, we, we had a story we had a it was shane actually my co-host who came up with the idea called um uh, memoirs of a salopia we were going to go around and speak to all the people of all the generations and speak to their lives back in the day you know what the places they used to work in the 60s and the the, the pubs they used to drink at things like that because we want to get the stories that grandfather or your nan or your dad always talks about, and so, oh, he's going on about that again. Get that on a microphone and get it up on here because in, in 20, 30 years, those stories will be forgotten. Yeah. And so exactly we, what we did. Yeah. Or what we do right now. Yeah. yeah. We, we are collectors. In some way, we are collectors. Information, yeah. so he's close to Kitty Hart Moxon. Yeah. Fantastic. So, guys, yeah, you know, if you've got any stories for us, but for that, you know, get in touch. <laughs> but also, if you do have any questions, my listeners, um, for Rainer, uh, for Simon, you can email us, shoesbybiscuitpodcast at gmail.com, or you can just message me, uh, inbox me on, on, fa- on Facebook, and I can forward those messages to Simon and, uh, or to Rainer uh, okay. for your friend request or something, you know. And we will try and get those questions answered because what we've talked about a lot today is hard hitting, but it would affect a, probably a lot of people that listen to this show, you know. You know, yeah. so I, I, would, I would imagine. So. Look, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you get out of here so you can enjoy carry on enjoying Shrewsbury. You're gonna go out for a pint or something after this. Oh, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I recommend the Prince of Wales is a great pub. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for joining me on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, make sure you give this episode a, a, a bit of a share. Tell people about it. Um, I've really enjoyed speaking to these guys. It's actually been quite emotional at times, and they've given me a nice this 
what's it called again? It's the, it's the, the pin. The it's the whore pin. And the way you explain, actually, before we go, you, the way you explain this is you you pass this on to your child, you pass this on to your children, and they pass yeah. it on to the fantastic, right, brilliant. I'll take a picture of that and put it on my. Right paper. now, over two and a half million hours went out. Fantastic, and I have one. And it's a sign of hope, right? Yeah. It means it means remember in Hebrew. Remember. Yeah. Sahor. Sahor. Fantastic. Thank you, guys, and make sure you join us next week. Raina, um, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to explain, right? I've just had the busiest <laughs> blooming day today. My head is all over the place. I forgot. Simon's the, like, he's biscuit royalty. Uh, Simon, and uh, thank you as well for joining me. It's been a, a really great episode. Thank you, guys, and peace out.